Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. You guys, it's two things. You guys look good, and you sound good. Come on, clap it up for yourselves. It's an honor and privilege to even just be here today, to be, al to be alive, to be alive. Um, I'm so, I'm, I don't know, it was something about young people. Loving God. Right, Nick? <laughs> Just Kevin doing the welcome. His heart. Anna. Edwin. Think about uh, Kiwante and Karen just being baptized, giving their heart. Loving God. Abel and Esther did an amazing job. I, I gave more money. I just gave more money. <laughs> I was like, wow. But to see their families here, to have a global vision, want to get to Haiti, send Abel to Mexico. You get this? <laughs> his, his mom was like this, no, no. <laughs> You're going with them. <laughs> so, what I want us to do, I just want us to just, I want us to hold hands. I want you to hold hands, I want you to close your eyes. Don't worry, I'm not gonna dig in your pocket for more contribution. Um, take a deep breath. Let it out. Take a brief breath, another deep breath. Let it out. Open your eyes. Look to the right. Look to the left. Look up. Look down. If you are above ground and you have breath, you still have purpose. There's something for you to still do in life. The fact that you guys are even holding hands together shows the unity and the power that this church has. We have something special here. Something exciting. You guys are still holding hands. I love y'all. <laughs> you can let go. <laughs> I don't want to. But at the end of the day, for many of you here today, it's going to be an hour, no, a half an hour of decision, of making a decision to be all in. I tell you, when you walk out of these doors, you're never going to be the same. Even if you refuse to make the decision, you will never be the same. Even if you refuse to come fully to Christ, you ain't going to be the same. So, just believe that lives will continue to change, miracles will happen, and dreams will come true. The title of the lesson is, Demand to expand. Demand to expand. That means demand is an urgency, forceful. To expand, demand, demand to expand your life. To expand, demand to, to expand. Whoa, let's go. To expand, demand to expand the kingdom of God. I was listening um, to someone tell me about the movie Noah. How many of y'all seen the movie Noah? I told him, go read Genesis 5. Um, great movie. I thought I was watching Transformers too, but um, <laughs> some of y'all didn't see it. But there was one thing I took out of that movie. When Noah, Russell Crowe, when he said, we have been entrusted with a task that's much greater than our desire. And I was like, whoa. He's really putting that into people's minds. That's what we're doing with God Almighty. Turn to Mark 2. Mark 2, verse 1. 
Everybody say amen. amen. When you get there, if you don't got a Bible, look at their Bible and say amen. amen. Mark 2, verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. Can you imagine that? After digging through it, they lowered the mat with the paralyzed man lying in it. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. It's an amazing vision right now. Can you imagine if this place was packed, which it will be? But can you imagine if, you know, we had Jesus right here speaking, and we're looking at him, and all of a sudden, you just hear a hole, somebody digging. You're like, what the heck? Jesus, are you going to let that? But he's not saying anything. He's probably still communicating with everybody. He's saying, stay laser focused. But in this, we don't have that problem here. We don't have that many people. We need to, right? But I tell you this. I want to ask you a simple question. Did you get the memo? He looking at me like, what memo? Matthew 28, 18. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything. When you think about this, when you made that decision, you got the memo. The minute that your blood connected with Jesus' blood, that was a signature. That's the thing that we sometimes miss. The memo. Point number one. As these men did, point number one. Who are you getting to heaven? Think about that. Who are you getting to Jesus Christ? Don't get serious on me right now. I truly believe that helping people keeps you saved. There's nothing else like that. My problems are nothing. I can't pay my, my cell phone bill. It's okay. Somebody that I'm studying was just about to commit suicide. These are the things that we need to ask ourselves. Are our problems more than the world's problems? Remember this, when God is asking you to speak to somebody, believe this, that God is asking that person to listen. When God is asking you to speak to somebody, God is telling that person to listen. You were once that person that God told you to listen to the disciples that are studying the Bible with you. You are that person that God is telling, go speak to that person. They need to be a disciple. Not, they can be a disciple. Bruce Lee had disciples. They need to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You guys are so powerful. You guys are some of the most outstanding people in the world. You guys got to start believing that. We will change the world. I look at this and I say, you know what? This paralyzed man, he was a vessel. But the vessel that the Holy Spirit had with the four men. So you got to ask yourself, which one are you? Are you a vessel? that has still sin in it, 
that is spiritually paralyzed, that you're needing four people to come and bring you in? Or are you a vessel that is carrying a paralyzed spiritual person? The vessel needs to be clean, guys. It needs to be clean. I told campus that. We would not do anything without a clean vessels. Our bodies need to be clean. You think about a container, right? And then you have a product in the container. When you really think about it, the container does not give value to the product. The product gives value to the container. So when you look at it, the vessel, right, does not give value to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives value to the vessel. That's why it's so important for us to be clean. How many mothers and fathers do we have here? I just want to make this point real quick. When you were feeding your baby or feeding a child, did you not clean the bottle out? Did you feed them something dirty? Can you imagine God wanting to feed his children? He's not going to give anything dirty to his children. We are that bottle. You guys with me a little bit? All right. When you really think about this, for 42 generations, God searched the earth looking for a clean vessel to put something in it. And he found Mary. She was pure. And he said, that's the one. I'm going to drop Jesus in her. Remember, it's not the container that gives value to the product. So that's why we don't worship Mary. We worship Jesus. Jesus is God. But Satan hates your body. He hates it. He hates it. If he can contaminate your body, if he can defile it, the Holy Spirit can't flow in it. That's why there's so many that are paralyzed spiritually. But it takes us to carry them. These four men did whatever it took to bring him to Jesus. Did whatever it took. I tell people all the time I deal with health and fitness, and I tell people all the time, oh, I want, I want a job, I want this, I want, I, want, I want a brand new car. No, that don't matter. Then you deal with, I deal with disciples, and they tell me, we want to change the world, we're going to do this. That don't mean nothing if your body's not healthy. You will not achieve those goals. God is more powerful than Satan. God is more powerful than Satan. I want you to get that in your mind right now, guys. One more. God is more powerful than Satan. We really got to think about that. Too many people walking around struggling. God ain't struggling. If God is in you, he's not struggling. And if you're in God, you're definitely not struggling because Satan can't get into God. Each one of you guys have the potential. Men, women, children, campus, teens, married. You guys have a potential to be a hero. You guys have a potential to impact the world. To be a hero because he rose for you. Point number two. If you don't control your emotions, we will not expand. If we do not control our emotions, we will not expand. I was talking to AJ the other day, and the conversation was great. 
It wasn't to AJ, but, but I picked up something. You gotta pick up the Christ in every single person. And AJ was talking to me, he says, I listened to him, I said, he said something that was so profound to me. He said, I care more about their souls than I care about their emotions. We need to gain a conviction about that. Somebody comes to you and they, this problem, and it, listen, I care about your soul. You're giving that too much power and not focusing on the power of God that can change all that. We got to be serious. We got to have these talks. When people come into the church, you got to give them a vision that they are going to be used for God. Clear. God has put that person in your life for a reason. To speak life into them. Yeah, we show them their sin. We show them how they can grow out of their sins. We don't talk about the problem more than we talk about the solution. We're going to make a global impact, guys. In these emotions and they, the thoughts and the projections that come into your mind, you really think about it. The Bible's clear in 2 Corinthians. Very clear. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Take every thought and make it captive. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. You ever find yourself telling yourself a story? And I'm talking about the, the emotions, the negative emotions. And you be there and you, you know, I can't believe this person tried to play me. I wasn't always saved. I was not always saved. And you get in that conversation with yourself and you're like, they really try to play me. They really try to play me. They came for me. And you really think about that person. But you catch yourself talking to yourself when that person isn't even there. You give power to that person when there are so many people in the present that need you. That's why I tell people, you got to pay attention to self-talk. You've got to pay attention to self-talk. What are you saying to yourself? Are you even, you, you can speak life into somebody, but can you speak life? Can you motivate yourself with God? Can you motivate yourself to wake up and have your quiet time? We guys, we got we to gotta take this to a whole new another level. In order to fill these seats, we got to take it to another level. We got to demand to expand. Call somebody up, share your quiet time with you. One thing I've learned that when you read something in the morning, you end up talking about it throughout the day. It's, th it's weird, but hey, it happens. You're like, oh, I was just reading that today. You, and then the person be like, oh, you was thinking about me in the morning? Uh, maybe. If I read it. But the key thing, we got to quit as a unit, as a group, as disciples of Jesus Christ. We got to quit building our lives around the pains of yesterday. Amen. The minute that you feel that emotion, the minute that you feel that self-talk, it needs to have a delay reaction. You need to catch yourself. A delay reaction. You have to. In order to build, control your emotions or they're going to control you. You got to make your emotions think. They need to stop and think. Not think with your emotions. Think about that, guys. Don't let 
Your feelings and emotions keep us from the success of God, of many walking in that are paralyzed spiritually, that will walk through here. But we're so focused on our problems and the things that are coming into our lives that we don't see the people that really need God. We got a message. We have something special. Let's not waste time. As I think about these four men, can you imagine them bringing them, bringing him? If I was, I'm like, dude, why did you do that? <laughs> what is wrong with you? Can you imagine the paralyzed, his emotions, his, his, what he might say, quit. He was like, he might have told them, stop. I don't want to go. What are you doing? Really? Through a roof? You guys are insane. And these guys know we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Can you imagine the other people's emotions? Maybe watching that. Hey, guys, what are you doing? You know, you get some church cops sometimes. It's okay. It's okay. They're here to protect and to serve, guys. <laughs> But when you really think about this, some of those people can be your family telling you, stop. Don't take that paralyzed man in. Why are you going to that church? Are you serious? You, want, you really believe that you're going to change the world. It's going to take too much. You need eight guys. You only got four. People will doubt if they're not in the power of God. But you got to believe in your mind and in your heart. Your body has to embody it that, yes, I will change the world. Yes, I'm going to contribute to filling these seats. Yes. Think about that, guys. You guys are quiet. I learned that, uh, I had a friend tell me, right? It was like, man, I'm not going to your church, man. As soon as I walk in, I'm going to burn. You ever get somebody to tell you that? And, and you'd be like, you know what? I think, I think you're wrong. I really think you're wrong. This is where you share your faith. Yes. Because if you stay out there, you're going to burn. You <laughs> guys, because I know my church got water. You ain't burning when you walk in here. <laughs> we got water. But I want us to get the mindset to really do whatever it takes to be one of those four men. You know what's crazy about it? In the story, he says four men. He didn't refer to them as disciples. So it might have been visitors. Hello, visitors. It's your first time. Raise your hand if it's your first time. Clap it up for them. Clap it up for them. So I believe the disciples had people in there because it said it was crowded. But I believe the visitors got the work. The visitors did whatever it took. No pressure. <laughs> what is it going to take for us, guys? Ladies and gentlemen, I keep calling you guys because I love you. It's going to take for us to adjust. In that one word, it takes a thousand actions. You can count them while you're doing it. Woke up early today, that's one. Had my quiet time, that's two. Still got more to go. But think about it. When you're at the grocery store, when you're at the market, wherever you at, the gym, I don't know wherever you go, I don't know where you go, I hope it's holy. <laughs> wherever you go, what we have incorporated in our, in our campus is this thing called do it now. 
So what we do is we see somebody that we need to share our faith, and we're looking at them, and we're like, uh, and then you start having all these doubts. You ever have all these doubts? They're not open. First thing you said, nah, not yet. I'll see them again. I've seen them before. Never seen that dude in your life. You start lying to yourself. <laughs> the one thing that we, we incorporated was the do it now mentality, the do it now mindset. And we clap, and then we say, when we see somebody, we clap, we say, do it now. When you see somebody, that, that person might be looking at you crazy. You might, they might be right in front, they might be right here, and you might be like, do it now. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Hi. They may look at you like you crazy. But I'm telling you, it works. I think I was with Abel the other day or something. He was like, do it now. And I'm like, where? Who? Let's go. So what I want us to do, I want us to say, do it now. 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 Woo! You guys are awesome. I feel like Corey, I'm sweating. <laughs> but what I really want to tell you, do you guys know who the greatest procrastinator is? <laughs> she know. Do you know who the greatest procrastinator is? But who leads that sometimes? Satan. Satan is the biggest procrastinator. Biggest. He tells you, next week y'all can do that. Hey, next, hey, next week y'all can go tagging. This Friday, you don't got to go. Don't worry. You can read your Bible at 3 p.m. Sleep in. He's the greatest procrastinator. Even in situations like that, we got to say, do it now. Nope, you tripping. You got to be so powerful. I was reading David and Goliath when he was talking to him. He told him exactly what he was going to do to him. And then he did it. Did you guys have to When you see somebody, when you see somebody, don't just look at the demons around that person. Look at the God that created him or her. And you tell that person, man, you, you know what? You look, you look like you want to make a global impact. They're like, huh? <laughs> Me? Que, <laughs> que? <laughs> but you tell that person, you know what? I want to invite you out to my church. We're doing great things. You don't want to invite them out and be like, you know what? Listen, for real, whoo, we about to cut out all that sin. You don't want to approach people like that. You want to approach them warm. Hey, I want to invite you to something. I believe that you can change the world. I see something in you. Because you got to think about it. Somebody saw something in each and every one of you and they never stop believing in you. And the person that studied with you, the person that studied with them never stop believing in them. There's something about believing in somebody. As soon as, that you, as soon as you see them, that you say, you know what? You will make a difference. <laughs> but let me show you when you are determined to, to, to demand to expand when you are determined to fill these seats up, when you're determined to get somebody to heaven. Let's read verse 5. When Jesus, let's read it together. How about that? You ready? When Jesus saw their faith, he said, don't stop when I stop. <laughs> Paralyzed man, your, sin, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith, so when Jesus sees you walking in with a visitor, right? He saw you walking in the church with a visitor. He wants that person saved more than you do. But he's looking at your faith if you're going to 
doubt. He's looking at your faith if you're going to pass them on to somebody else. I'm like, no, 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 you do it. You met that person for a reason. You take that person through the studies. I never gave up on Kiwante. There was times where I was by myself and I was looking like, Dad, what the heck? Nobody's here to study with him. And I came to a conclusion like, we need more people to step up. We need three other people to bring this paralyzed man to Jesus. In thinking about that, I always remember Kiwante study. Just me and him in the garage. And I just say, you know what? You're going to change the world. You're going to help people. I never stop believing in them. In campus, you know that. I always believe in each and every one of you. Any person here, something about believing in them. Your Bible talk leaders, they believe in you. They believe in you so much to spend their money for food to feed you. We need to get you strong. Get you some cornbread. <laughs> Point number three. We're almost done, guys. Point number three. Don't let it go into the next generation. Don't let it go into the next generation. I started to think about the crowd and who was listening to them. Bless you. And I was like, Jesus loved the kids. So there probably was kids there. There probably was like married people. You know how married people do their whole hand. One day, one day, guys, we'll get there. Single people. But there probably was teens there. Listening to him speak as he cut out sin out of this man and told him to walk. Then I looked deeper into the Bible and I started to think about something that I was meditating on like four months ago. When David looked at Bathsheba As soon as he looked at her, there was a lustful thought. He committed adultery. He committed murder. He lied. And then I started to think about his son that was birthed, Solomon, and what he was born out of, lust. And guess what Solomon struggled with? Lust. 700 wide, 300 concubines. There was lust there. There was a struggle there. He did amazing things. And then I started to go deeper into myself and started to think about what did I pick up from my parents? What bad habits? And I started to think about my mother struggled with anger. My dad, in his mind, could have any girl in the world. He had a, he had a wife, and then he, it was us. And I said, you know what? That can't come into me. That can't go into the next generation. And I looked at that, and I said, my mother was only 15, and my dad was 38. There was lust there. And I said, no, it stops. It has to stop. It has to stop. And I ask you today, guys, what habits have you picked up? Not the, not the good habits, the bad habits. 
Or if you have kids, what habits are you showing them? Don't let it go into the next generation. I think about, as I went deeper into the Bible, somehow going deeper into the Bible, it's fun in there. I say God is so deep, you can swim in him all day and never drown. He's just fun. And I think about Ruth. Anybody read the book of Ruth? All the women like, yeah, I'm Ruth. When you think about Ruth, her husband died. Can you imagine that if your husband dies? Or your wife? And then she has Naomi there and she says, you know what, Naomi? Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And then you look at Ruth, where she came from. The Moabites, and where did they come from? How did they even exist? The Moabites existed because Lot slept with his daughters. And then you have Boaz, whose mother was a prostitute. And then God said, I'm going to do something right here. He brought them two together, and then they birthed Obed. And then they birthed Jesse. And David. And then we know that Jesus comes from that bloodline. So when I think about that, I think about us. Not letting it go to the next generation. It's stopping it with us. That's why it's so important for us to be disciples. You know, you get your, you get your mentoring, your discipling time. Man, you got to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. They're like, huh? That's it? That's all you got for me? Yeah. You got to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That way, the world can't see in the negative and the, and the impurities and the, the weak emotions don't get into the next generation. It's so important for us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. In this day and age, don't wait for tomorrow. Don't be a procrastinator. Monday, I'm going to get spiritual. No. Do it now. <laughs> you got to remember that as long as there's a heartbeat, there's hope. You can change and everybody else can change. I was thinking about this. Some of us today still have what our parents have given us. And I can see it. You know how I can see it? Because I know each one of your parents tell you don't talk to strangers. Each one of your parents told you don't talk to strangers. You know how I know you don't talk to strangers? And that's what we can't bring into the next generation. Jesus wasn't even about that. At 12 years old, he was talking to strangers. He saw the God in them. Even when he had the crowd of people, he was talking to strangers. This wasn't his family. You guys with me a little bit? Just a little bit. When I found out that that I can be a disciple of Jesus Christ, I was scared. I was like, is this true? I, gotta, I know I can't do that. I made some mistakes. I made some mistakes. But the best thing I did was learn from them. I learned from them. I never hold a grudge. I let everything in the past be the past. I bring it out when somebody else needs to hear it. But I said, that won't be my life. I lived it that way they, that you won't have to live it. I get to share it. Your testimony is so powerful. Coming in right here, guys. iPhones. We are building the elite, guys. You're strong, you're powerful, 
You can do anything in the world for God. We got to demand it. You got to demand your relationship with God. You got to give your God, say, God, here goes my insides. Let them be all yours. Point number four. Catch the vision. Catch the vision again and again and again. If you can't see it, borrow somebody else's eyes. Borrow my eyes. I believe in you. The higher we go, the higher we grow spiritually, the more we see. The more it's for us to do. Somebody asked me the other day, they was like, well, what, what do you think about life? I think life is like a roller coaster. I was like, really? I said, yeah. I said, you get up, and you start going all the way, and you're like, click, 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 click. Anybody ever been on a roller coaster? No. Like, click, 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 click. And then you start seeing, you're like, whoa, that's over there? I'm definitely going to go over there and eat. And then you start going. And then you finally get to the top. And they was like, what, what happens? And I said, that's the waters of baptism. Because I studied the Bible and went all the way up. And then, I, and then I got dipped into the water of baptism, came out, went through it. But there was two things that happened. I could have been scared on this roller coaster. Or I could have been with, I, I'm with my hands up, praising God and thanking him when I get to heaven. <sighs> you know how you, you've been on a roller coaster when you get off, you're like, whoa, I'm never going back on that. <laughs> never. If I get to heaven, I'm like, God, can we do it again if it's not finished? But I believe that we're going to do it. Guys, you guys are awesome. I want to take a moment and appreciate what we have here. Closing out, appreciate what we have. I appreciate the people that have came from the old movement. The Pat, the Pams, the Chris Bryans, the Corey Blackwells, Megan Matthew, and we got Brad. Come on, I see y'all over there, eh? <laughs> We got something special here, guys. Really, really special. They've seen something that we have not seen. They've seen it. And we want to see it. But I want to lift up somebody really, really important to us. That's Corey Blackwell. Corey Blackwell is a great guy. It's not his funeral, so um, I'm not speaking like that. <laughs> but listening and talking to Corey, and I was like, man, and hearing stories, you hear stories about Corey, but not Corey Blackwell, Corey the vessel for God. And I was thinking, Corey planted 30 churches. This guy knows what he's doing. Overseeing and in charge of 36,000 Christian disciples. He's a very humble man to walk in this door to only see a couple hundred. To give his time. To give patience. To give his love. To see that many Christians, 36,000? Do you believe that you're going to see that? I'm asking you. What we have here is amazing. That story, listening to it, hearing him talk, hearing other people talk, hearing, seeing what he's trying to just envision it, it shows me that it's possible. It shows us that it's beyond possible. Remember, the higher we grow, spiritually, the more we see. Turn to Acts 2, closing out. How y'all feeling? Y'all good?
Verse 17. Amen when you get there. It says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. When you look at that and you see a young man or young woman having a vision and a mature person, well, the Bible says old, an old person coming in and having a dream that it could be done. You have vision and dream, and when you marry those two together, you get an unstoppable, unshakable generation. We really got to take this serious. Matthew 18 says, where two or three or more gather in his name, he is with us. If we can agree on anything, does that make sense? That if we agree on anything, anything, Matthew 18, 19 through 21. If we agree to showing Jesus our faith, if we agree on gathering as many as possible, if we agree to control our emotions, if we agree to change the world, Corey told me a saying the other day, share with two people a day, keep Satan away. Share with two people a day, keep Satan away. What I really want to ask you is, to be like Jesus, to get 12. He had 12 disciples rolling with him. You guys have friends, you guys have family. People in the marketplace. Anywhere, they're there. They're praying for you. If God, Lord willing, wherever he sends me, Middle East, wherever, it doesn't even matter. Wherever he sends me, I know, I believe that somebody's praying to me, me, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine in Vegas and in the Middle East? Those people are trapped. Those people like, man, Jesus Christ. Do something. We need you. Send us people that will stand up for you. And there's people in Hawthorne, in Torrance, in Inglewood that are saying those same prayers in these concrete jungles. You guys are powerful. <sighs> Two minutes. Acts 5. Acts 5, verse 19. Amen? Amen. You guys are powerful. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the door of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. The door has been opened. You guys have freedom. The minute that you raised your hand and you thought God was gonna put the handcuffs off, what he did was really take them off. He thought he was gonna put them on, but he took them off and he says, you have freedom in me. I challenge every one of you to go get your 12. When you get your 12, the 12 will get the 72, the 72 will get the 120, the 120 will get the 3,000, and we will get the world. I just thank you for just listening to me. I thank God for just even being here. Thank God for your salvation, my salvation, and let's demand to expand. All glory be to God.